we'll get started. This is uh, for my own sanity. I've added some new slides. Uh, but many of the veterans in the room have seen versions of this before. Okay. Let us use mouse work. All right. So we're going to talk about prosthetic valve functional imaging. One of the big challenges is that there are so many valves out there now. Um, the Doppler profiles, or many of them, are different. Um, but they all have similar features, and so we'll talk most about more about what's similar than, than what's different. We'll talk about um, how we currently assess prosthetic valve function and emphasize, at least in some case examples, about why it actually matters. So different flow profiles, different orifice areas for all of these different valves. So it is important to recognize, particularly when you get into Doppler evaluation, um, what is the normal flow pattern across the prosthesis. Um, one of the examples is in this, you know, mechanical valve, typically, well, aortic or mitral, but you tend to see it more in the mitral. But there is clearly a high velocity population of flow through the smaller central orifice, lower velocities through the larger side lobes. So when doing a Doppler interrogation, it's important to recognize that and consider that when you're trying to come up with a total uh, prosthetic valve gradient. So some of the basic things that we talk about with, prosth with prostheses. You're looking for the obvious things, um, the mechanistic things that cause dysfunction. So panis, embolism, um, thrombus rather. Obviously endocarditis will show some examples. Hemolysis, which you're not going to see, but you'll see the cause of the hemolysis. It's usually a small, high-velocity jet uh, by color Doppler. Dehiscence, which is just the valve falling out. Uh, primary failure, which is exceedingly rare but not unheard of. We've seen a case. Um, three days after implantation of what was deemed to be primary failure of a, of a mechanical valve, and then mismatch we'll talk about. So these are still the most current guidelines, the 2009. Um, this is still, you know, the reference you should all know about. It's the vast majority of all of this guideline is still uh, uh, relevant. The addition to this guideline then would be the additional uh, interrogation of transcatheter heart valves, and then perhaps some inclusion of 3D echo techniques. That's really all that's changed, but this is still the vast majority of the current recommendations, and many of the slides you'll see today come from these guidelines. So the general approach to prosthetic valve evaluation is think structure, think function. That's kind of how we approach even native valves as well. Um, for the structural elements, you're looking at the actual motion of the uh, leaflets, if, when you can see them, particularly in mechanical valves, but you can also see that in a good uh, T, typically of a bioprosthetic valve. You look for the obvious um, things that shouldn't be there, either above or below the valve, including panis and thrombus, and then any complications or local tissue destruction. And then on a functional side, we tend to focus on the same things we do with native valves, velocities, gradients, derived area, and any evident regurgitation. All right, so starting kind of easy. Uh, you know, this is a uh, uh, prosthetic aortic valve. Really, this is a simple question, is it normal or abnormal uh, in its function? So I'll give you a single CW, it's got a peak velocity. Let's say that's, it actually looks higher on my, that's funny, on my screen it's... It says 2.5. What's that? 2.5 in the screen here. Yeah, it's amazing. On my screen, on the laptop, it's clearly like 3.2. <laughs> so it, it really fades away here. That's amazing. I've never noticed that. Very display dependent. I wonder how much that gets us in the echo lab, actually. Um, so anyway, three and a half. Or 3.2. Um, okay, but it's kind of relatively early peaking. It, it's actually amazing how badly it displays. But the peak on my laptop is here. Um, so it's you know clearly between the halfway point of the total ejection time. Uh, the upslope is, is more impressive. Um, but you know what we're considering and where this sort of data comes from. Uh, this is a paper from this institution several decades ago really just looking at mean gradient and how the mean gradient changes by valve size. As expected, the bigger the valve you put in, the smaller the mean gradient. Uh, small valves have large mean gradients. That's not a surprise. But what is interesting is the range of what is considered normal even for a small valve. So a 19 is actually a very small valve. Uh, prosthetic valves or really bike tilting discs like a St. Jude tend to have slightly better hemodynamics than, than other versions of mechanical valves of that size. But even this, and what a valve is considered normal, has a mean gradient of 25. And this one's even up to 30. Uh, whereas if you put a 29 in, you're more like 10 or 15. So 
on average, you know, for a mechanical valve, um, depends obviously where it's put in and what the flow is, but typically across the mitral, across the aortic valve, tend to see mean gradients of, of 20, aren't, uh, you know, aren't usually concerning, but large variation based on size. So the size does matter, so, so the, sonographers, the sonographers in the room, you know, uh, as a lab, it's very beneficial if you actually can identify not just the type of valve, but the size of valve. Um, it makes a huge difference if it's present on the top of the report. It makes a lot of this interrogation much easier. When it's missing, it means somebody has to go look for it. So the Doppler velocity index is a dimensionless index. Uh, this is useful when you really can't get a good LVOT diameter, so therefore you can't derive an area. But it's really just a ratio of the velocity uh, before and after the valve. Um, it has no units. And that's all it is, straight uh, what did the velocity do? And if it stepped up more than four times, that's generally an indicator of uh, stenosis. So a DVI ballpark, less than 0.25, and there's some data um, that actually says up to about three. So somewhere between 0.25 and three for most prosthesis is um, you know, when you start to think about uh, stenosis. But this doesn't really apply to the transcatheter valves. So that's one of the things that's not in the guidelines. Transcatheter valves just have much better hemodynamic profiles because they don't have any struts in the way. So the DVI on a prosthetic valve, nobody's really put together a good series of dysfunctional or stenotic uh, transcatheter heart valves. But if you look at what's normal in all of the early trials, the normal is between 0.5 and 0.6. So keep that in mind when we're using the drop-down DVI greater than you know, 0.3 normal. On a, on a transcatheter heart valve, you really should be closer to 50, not 30. All right, and this is just an example of here's a normal uh, and here's an obstructed. Both are fairly similar LVOT VTIs because the flow at this point is not uh, uh, changed. Um, and here's some of the general features. So for a normal valve, we have a mean gradient of 22. We have a DVI of 0.4. We have an acceleration time, how long, from the beginning of ejection to the peak uh, of 75 milliseconds. In contrast to an obstructed valve, uh, you get a higher mean gradient, so that's not easy. That's not hard, rather, to miss. The velocity is, you know, 5.5, so that this is sort of grossly abnormal. Nobody would miss this one. But it highlights some of the features. The DVI, in this case, is 0.18. Uh, so a big step up in velocity from the LVOT to the aorta. And the ejection time, or the acceleration time, rather, how long does it take to get to the peak of the ejection is 180 milliseconds. So in general, once you're over 100 milliseconds of ejection time, or acceleration time, rather, uh, that's concerning for stenosis. And, and really, you know, you don't put all your eggs into one particular finding. Like a lot of things in ECHO, it's a summation of all of these different features that increase your confidence in making the call. So the more features you have, the more confident you are in calling uh, prosthetic stenosis. Um, and this is just uh, one of the, uh, this is again a paper from this lab a few decades ago showing some DVIs of a particular type of valve across multiple sizes. Uh, but note, one of the interesting features is that this is based on only four that were considered abnormal and clinically stenotic, and they had DVIs of less than 0.2. So this is actually, you know, as far as I know, the data that made it into the guideline recommendation uh, of between 0.25 and 0.3. So we tend to use, you know, 0.3 as a hard cutoff, recognizing that it's only these four cases that actually drive that number. So uh, don't put uh, all of your faith in one number. And we get that. You know, we get referrals all the time from an echo lab elsewhere. The DVI is 0.29, you know, send for valve and valve. Uh, they haven't really featured in any of the other uh, issues around the echo uh, evaluation. All right, so I think this is actually the same case I showed, basically the same numbers uh, of normal and obstructed, just maybe a little larger so you can see it a bit better. Um, this is uh, straight out of the guidelines. These are uh, just a collection of what's considered the normal features. So again, the stuff you're looking for is the, for a, this is for an aortic prosthesis, peak velocity, mean gradient, uh, the DVI as we just mentioned. Again, 0.3 is the number that's in the guidelines, and we just talked about where that comes from. An EOA of 1.2 or greater. That 1.2 is interesting. That still is the number that basically permeates the transcatheter heart valve world. It's, you know, most normals are at least 1.2, uh, often closer to 1.5. Uh, but we haven't really changed what's expected to be a normal valve area. Again, the uh, semi-quantitative uh, features like an early peaking triangular CW, just like in native AS, you still want to see those features if you're going to call it uh, uh, normal. 
and then acceleration time is how long does it take to get the blood out, uh, less than 80 milliseconds. In contrast, the, the other end of the spectrum, the clearly stenotic valves, high velocities just like native AS, high mean gradients, the DVI, less than 0.25 for the reasons we talked about, a small valve area, and then a rounded sort of late peaking CW contour, and an, an acceleration time which we already reviewed, generally over 100 milliseconds. So that, that's really part and parcel of going with the rounded uh, CW. That's really a manifestation. That's a quantitation of the roundedness. Yeah? One, one quick pearl for, for the fellows is that noticing the LV outflow PW tracing that it is also rounded and late peaking. That can sometimes help you if you have a lousy CW. If you have one of those patients where you struggle to get the highest velocity, you notice that roundness and that delay. That should be a blinking one, a blinking light. Hey, you know, there might be a problem. Let's maybe a few more or two other windows. Right. Well, you're right. That is probably overlooked at the two months. The LV is also light. Oh, you yeah, this is a continuum, right? These are about dichotomous variables or cutoff variables. This is a continuum. So you look at all this. Yes, we have to come up with some cutoffs for all these valves to make some sense. But, you know, you grab a 3.8, you know, you know you're a 7. So the, the more you are on the extremes, the more you're comfortable with. In between, that's why we say possible stenosis because we have to come up with a terminology for you, but here's the way we plan. I can tell you for acceleration time will be validated that if you have something greater than 130 milliseconds, you can take it with a magazine, it's effective, no matter what, mechanical or otherwise. So what I'm saying here is take a look at that continuum in extremes and it becomes very helpful. In between, you may have to do further investigation to figure out what's going on. Um, so a word on patient prosthesis mismatch, you know, thankfully at this center it's not a term we use all that often. Uh, at some centers it really is still a, 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 a diagnosis. Um, but the concept is really simple, that the, the, the prosthesis is just too small for the patient. Um, so there's nothing dysfunctional about the valve, it's just, you know, it's too small for, for them. So the concept is that really you've got normal valve function, yet when you measure an effective orifice area, uh, or a gradient, they seem to be high compared to somebody who was, um, you know, had a larger size valve. So the definition is important to know. This will show up on echo boards and in other centers. Um, so moderate PPM is a, uh, defined as 0.85 centimeter squared per meter squared, so it's indexed already. That is important to recognize the indexation. And then severe of 0.65. So those are the numbers. Conceivably, one of the reasons this is a challenge, at least in Houston, and probably increasingly throughout all of America, um, is obesity. Because you're indexing this value to a body surface area, and the body surface areas tend to be larger. It doesn't mean the flow requirement of that individual is larger, because generally adipose tissue doesn't really uh, require a whole lot of metabolic activity. So this is one interesting paper in the era of obesity, that when you match valve area to BSA, it may not reflect mismatch. So if you look at those folks who have a start on the left, a BMI under 30 kilograms, and then you calculate the EOA of a prosthesis. If the EOA is small, then clinically they behave as if it's severe stenosis. They don't do well. Uh, yet, if you look at the population, the only significant difference is the BMI. When the BMI is over 30, the label of PPM, or severe PPM, doesn't really impart any mortality problem. So it suggests in that, in that population, it's really a misdiagnosis. And the explanation for the misdiagnosis is the indexing to obesity. So I've never yet seen somebody who's tried to index valve area to height, but that might make more sense. Okay, so all of this leading to, you know, and part of the, the answer is Dr. Zalagby was mentioning, you've got, you know, for example, on that possible stenosis uh, chart, maybe you've got three out of those six features. Well, this is the critical thing, is to look back on old echoes and see has something changed. If you come out of the OR and your first post-op, you know, good quality study has an elevated mean gradient, an elevated acceleration time, a small EOA, chances are you have the dreaded mismatch. Um, but if you acquire it two or three years later, you've got valve dysfunction. All right, so this is sort of an approach um, for the aortic valve prosthesis. 
in, in general, this is sort of the thinking on it. You generally start for most folks, and I guess this is, I suppose, predicated on having normal LV systolic function. Okay, so if you've got normal LV systolic function and, and reasonable stroke volumes, uh, and your velocity is over three meters, that should get your attention. And then you go to the next point and say, well, what's the DVI? If the DVI is uh, high, that's initially reassuring. If the DVI is high but the acceleration time is long, then you should consider stenosis, perhaps some sub bulk, because you've got basically things that aren't consistent. The velocity is concerning, the DVI is reassuring, yet the acceleration time is then concerning again. So perhaps it's a quality issue, the impro improper LVOT velocity uh, capture. Um, if you look in the middle here, high velocity, DVI is okay, and a brisk acceleration time, that's now reassuring. So this is taking you back, back towards the normal pathway here. Uh, if the EOA index is small, again, even one here, uh, you might have PPM, but now you've got a bit of an inconsistency because patient prosthesis mismatch, in theory, should give you an accel an, uh, uh, prolonged acceleration time. And then finally over here, this is where it gets easier. This is elevated. This is low. This is elevated. That's, that's, that's when you really start to be considering uh, stenosis. And then if this doesn't make sense, that's high, that's low, and this is brisk, that's more likely a quality of the Doppler application. So it's kind of a thought process to go through, but the first cut generally is, to, like we all do, what's the peak velocity? So one of the things that is, you know, will be reflected in the next version of these guidelines is, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, transcatheter valves have different Doppler uh, hemodynamics. In fact, even some of the newest surgical valves, instead of having the leaflets inside the struts, they actually put the leaflets on the outside of the struts, for example, the trifecta valve. So the net effect there is that the struts are in the flow area, but the flow area gets larger. So even some of the newest surgical valves have even lower uh, mean gradients and better human and performance. So uh, we're getting down now to, you know, sing well, single digits for, this is an example of the trifecta valve uh, because of the design. So newest version uh, of some uh, models of bioprosthetic valves have single digit gradients, but recognizing we still put in a lot of the older generation that have higher mean gradients. So, yeah. Is there any data, or is it too early to tell, that the lower gradients, meaning lower velocity, meaning perhaps less friction on the tissue, may actually make those valves last longer? No, I haven't seen none, none in terms of... It kind of makes sense when you think about it. <laughs> so you have less friction in the, in the tissue and all that. Maybe these valves that are newer may end up after the last one the longer they have. They have less gradients beating on them all the time. Yeah. Simplistically. Yeah. The head-to-heads are tough. I mean, the, the, the data, I, I have not seen that particular. No, in fact, you know, what happens for a lot of these valves is they get two or three hours out two or three years out, and then people start to have some concerns because they're crimped differently, they're fixed differently. It's such a moving field of technology, even amongst the surgical valves. Uh, the ones we're putting in are not the same as the ones five years ago. So yeah. any duration, it durability, who are you comparing to now? Because there's so many things have changed compared to the ones five years ago. But the hemodynamics are different. Um, and this is just an example of that. This is that one particular trifecta valve. Um, and the Taber valves, and this just slide is sort of the, and this is pretty well what we see here, and this is what the trials show. So it's almost expected a single digit mean gradient for the aortic valve after a transcatheter valve. Uh, certainly with the commercially available ones, um, the portico, the, the sapien, the core valve, they're all in that range. And the, some versions of the, um, like the trifecta bioprosthetic are also in that range. Uh, but the mechanical valves are not. Mechanical valves you would still expect more like a 15 to 20. All right, so looking at some, some complications. Um, again, we're still looking at mostly aortic. This one's pretty obvious. So I've got a T, you've got large paravalvular defect. You see it in long axis and in short axis. Uh, this is easy. When we get into TABR, it's probably not so easy. Um, several different valves, similar concept. You see it in short axis. You see it in long axis. One of the main challenges for the evaluation is, though, it's, it isn't a single point. So when you've got a surgical valve, 
the sewing ring is the sewing ring. It's, you know, there's not much depth to it. That's where you're going to get PVL. On a transcatheter heart valve, what you notice is that the length of the valve is quite different, and therefore its contact point within the ascending aorta is quite different. So you can get PVL that starts up here, snakes kind of, you know, around semi-clockwise or counterclockwise, and it pumps out over here. It may not be a straight shot, and where it initiates kind of different depth. So it's much more important on a transcatheter heart valve to interrogate multiple short axes to try to evaluate where the PVL is. On a surgical valve, you've got a smaller range to target. On a transcatheter valve, you have to interrogate much further along to actually find the PVL. Um, so that's one of the main, the main technical challenges is identifying where the PVL starts, where it actually comes out in the LVOT. Is it a straight shot, which it may not be? Uh, and then there's other issues around how do you actually quantitate the severity. Um, so effectively, these aren't much different than the quantitation of uh, native AI, um, with the exception of PVL. So PVL is a bit different, but otherwise, for surgical valves with central AR or, or transcatheter valves with central AR, it's much the same in terms of the native valve. So one of the interesting things from all these different prostheses is identifying what is the normal color Doppler pattern and what's the abnormal pattern. So one of the things on a when you have two tilting discs. You have these little washing jets, and we have a couple of patients floating around, and I have one with a Bjork Shiley, a single tilting disc, and they get one quite dominant um, jet, but that's normal uh, for this particular valve. Uh, it's a closing jet. And then a ball cage, and I have, still have one patient with a ball cage. You guys have ball, anybody with a ball cage valve? Yeah, I have one. She's, yeah, she's 50, and she got this valve when she was 15. Uh, but she's, it's still working well. Her VST is a bit of a problem, but her ball cage valve is great. Um, so this is a case uh, looked at recently. So this is TE for uh, prosthetic valve function. This is the color profile, a bunch of little jets, but even some crisscrossing jets. Um, so the question to those in the audience, is this paravalvic regurgitation? Is this normal or abnormal? So one of the ways we can do this, I use this case to illustrate some of the features of what P, uh, PVL versus washing jets should look like. If you look at the 3D of the valve, it looks grossly, trust me, the leaflets are moving okay. This is a color. It's stitched together. Pretty hard to tell anything from this. Uh, and this is generally the way it pops out of the machine. Uh, it's rotated so the aortic valve is at top. You're looking down the mitral valve. You can sort of make out the hinge point here and another one up here. It's hard to see much in terms of that color pattern. So first thing I do is just increase the color filter. So you take that overloaded color, and you just turn up the filter a little bit. And I'll pause it to show you here. So this is a, a systolic frame. And you see these three little jets. But important to recognize, their origin is at the hinge points. So there's a hinge point here, a hinge point here. The valve is oriented in this direction. So these little jets that originate at the hinge points are normal. So that's really a, a differentiating feature of washing jets. They come out of the hinge points, and they're inside the sew ring. And this is just looking from the side. There's the orientation of the hinges this way, or if the valve is that way. So hinge points, they all start here. They may crisscross and go different places, but where they start is very different than PVL. Any questions on that? That's not something that you may have seen. OK. So washing jets are basically associated with the hinge points. Um, prosthetic mitral valve. Uh, so you measure a bunch of different things. Go back a little bit. Uh, that, that beautiful, go back even further. Um, those three jets that you see are we see yep. is whenever you see the valve almost, uh, you see the two leaflets going in, but if you go in the opposite <coughs> line, the plane, also the crisscrossing is typical, right? That's what you showed on the 3D. The 3D you see the 3D. Those three jets are coming in this direction almost to meet. And that's been shown in vitro, basically. You take a look at the valve and <coughs> see what kind of jets come out of it. So you gotta keep, because that's the most common valve that is put in, you better know exactly what it looks like. Yeah. And you don't need 3D. I'm just, I use that to show you the origin right at the, at the hinge yeah, point. Because they're coming at the hinge point, you start wondering whether this is a paravalve or a leak because it's going to be close to the solar drain, right? Yeah. 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 When you said filter, is that the releasing velocity or is that another? No, it's a knob on uh, a 
it's going to be different on every vendor's box, but you do the general acquisition, you don't play with the gains. It's not a gain, but when on the QLab display, I don't know why, there's a nominal setting where the filter's at, I think it's one or two. So whenever we're doing this kind of stuff with playing with 3D color, the first thing we do is just go to the, the color filter box, there's a little scale, and I just tick eight or nine. So you it's just not on the acquisition side. Not on the acquisition it's side. The, it's not on the machine either. Uh, you can launch QLab on the box, but it's, in, it's a QLab feature. It's, it's for the display. It basically just increases the display of the color, because otherwise it always shows you too much color. Right. But if you turn down the color gain at the acquisition, you may not have anything. I wish we could tell them that actually you could have it on the machine, because then you could capture it better, right? As opposed to launching. Or, or post-capture, at least. At least something you could do right there. It'd be nice. Yeah. Well, I mean, you could do, I mean, on the box, you launch QLab. Because what you're saying is so true. I mean, you, you're always between the rock and the hard place. If you bring the game down, you don't have nothing. <coughs> if you bring it up, then it's a mess of what you do. Yeah. So, so I, it's not until you get to the QLab, but you can do that, that you can then... Yeah. I find it's much easier to have the data and filter it away. Yeah. Then if you have the gains down, you never get the data. And then you never get the data. And you can't <laughs> add it afterwards. Uh, yeah. I think they have changed it, actually. The, when I met with Philips recently, they recognized this. So the newest version of whatever, the IE, whatever, uh, has a different approach to this. So they, they've actually upped the, the nominal filters. But for localizing jets and that kind of stuff, it just takes away all the garbage and just shows you uh, what you're looking at. OK. Um, all right, so just a couple examples. So uh, these are Dr. Zogby's slides from I think these are in the guidelines. Uh, so large mass, pre-thrombolysis, post-mass, or post-thrombolysis. Not only does the mass disappear, but the gradients reduce. Uh, we don't do this very often, I must say. We've had a few cases with prosthesis. We and don't see them that often either. I think uh, yeah. because we're seeing so many less microprosthesis. This was a very different There was a time when we were yeah. seeing this. This was a Jehovah's Witness. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, no choice. Soon post up, just imagine. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We, I mean, we have cases that I've seen here where you've had uh, the mass get smaller and the gradient get better, but it never went to normal. And uh, not, not recently. Okay. So a grossly dysfunctional mitral valve. You see it rocking. You see the space. Um, you know, when, when do you call it dehiscent versus just a large PVL? Uh, I wouldn't hesitate to call this dehiscence. There's, there's a lot of leaflet motion that's, I mean, the annulus is moving, the silvering is moving, uh, in addition to the obvious paravalvular defect. Would you agree? Would you call this dehiscence? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think there is a, de di a definition of more than a quarter of the silvering, but you don't see that in most views. You just see it moving. Um, so this is the, the, the flip side of the VTI. Uh, ratio of the, to the mitral valve. So now instead of dividing uh, the LVOT by the higher velocity, you, d you flip it the other way around. So you divide the mitral inflow velocity by the LVOT. So you think of the way the blood's going, and that's the way you do it. Mitral divided by LVOT. Um, and this is an example of that. So you've got the, the valve, the mitral valve uh, prosthesis. It's got a VTI of 42. You've got the LVOT, VTI of 16. So because the ratio conceptually is inverted, now uh, a big number is bad. So you want to be less than 2.2. Uh, what did this derive from, Dr. Zogby? I don't remember the derivation of these numbers. Was it based on the validation data from this lab, actually, by two investigators, two uh, fellows. One is Dr. Olmos, who looked at uh, Leopoldo Olmos, some of you may remember, from Venezuela. And he did that for any prosthetic valve. And the other one was Dr. Valerian Hernandez, right. who did prosthetic mitral valve regurgitation. So if you want prosthetic mitral valve regurgitation, normally it's less than 2.2, but you know, if you want to be more specific, it would be like 2.5 and above. Okay. Um, concept is, again, uh, it's very interesting because I don't know if you're going to go through that. Yeah, this one. Um, Go back a little bit. If you have if you have regurgitation of the valve, you have a two way to emphasize this great this ratio. If you have regurgitation, flow through the micro valve is increased because of the micro regurgitation, right? But at the same time, flow of the LVI flow tract is decreased because of the regurgitation. Right? So it enhances your ratio. 
So that's one. If you have prosthetic hypervalve stenosis, right, the TBI of this hypervalve is going to increase by itself, and the outflow is going to stay the same. So the ratio is going to be increased, but may not be. The magnitude may be the same because in a regurgitation, this is, velocity interval is not tremendously high. In a stenosis, it is significantly high. That's why it, it, it could be a guide for any dysfunction, stenosis or regurgitation. So that, that's what you have right here. Yeah. So two general, you know, sort of quick clues that the valve is dysfunctional, high velocity, E-wave, an elevated ratio of mitral to LVOT. And then if you've got a very prolonged halftime, more likely to be stenotic. If you have a brisk halftime, more likely to be regurgitant. But again, you're not. This is for mechanical. Huh? Bioprosthetic, the numbers are very different. And people have really not looked at them. Mm -hmm. They are, the peak velocity normal is higher than 1.9. Because you would, think, you would think that a bioprosthesis is more effective or more efficient hemodynamically, it's not. The struts actually hinder the uh, flow, and then normal could be 2.2, 2.3, something like this. So I don't know what the ratio would be. Hmm. I, I didn't know it had been looked at. Yeah. Um, okay, so again, straight out of the guidelines. Um, this is really not different from the native MR guidelines. Uh, so it doesn't really matter uh, for central MR evaluation. Uh, and then we think we've just gone through this. So I guess this is probably important to, to comment and pause upon is the mean gradient. So we still use a mean gradient cutoff of about 10 to differentiate severe from less than severe prosthetic MR, uh, uh, mitral valves. Uh, again, it's very heart rate dependent. It's very flow dependent. Um, in general, that equates to a uh, calculated valve error of less than one and a prolonged pressure halftime. Um, but it's amazing. I mean, we've seen patients with dialysis and end-stage renal fairly young, and they've, been, they've come to us with mean gradients of 25. Um, so that'd be super, super, super severe, I suppose. Um, and we've had patients who were symptomatic with the mean gradients of five or six. So how we use a cut point of 10, I'm not sure, but it is generally established and it's not different than the native valves. Um, that's part of the reason you have a, such a wide range. Yeah. You have to aim, if you say suggest significant stenosis, you have to aim something a little more specific, right? Uh, and then you have somewhere, I just don't know. And part of the issue with micro <coughs> is it is so dependent on heart rate with diastolic frame period. So, you could have a normal valve with an tachycardic state, and then you have a high grade. Shane, can you go to the previous slide? Yep. Because this is, this is really on a day to day. Uh, you know, paravalvular leaks are the most common geology. Occasionally, you have bad dysfunction inside. The, the transonatic screening puts you into the okay, I'm suspicious of. Sometimes you can see the color, but most of the time, you know. So 90 plus percent of the time, we are in the environment of a TED. And assessing severity of a barbara leak can be tricky even with TED. I don't know if you want to show some examples of those that, because it is, it is a little you know, tricky. It's not that it's, you may have a pinhole leak giving hemolysis. You may have a relatively mild moderate one, a patient is asymptomatic. So, you know, when you look at that table, it has a lot of beautiful things. The truth of the matter is that most of the time, we are down there in the TE trying to look at the villa contracta width because forget about the guidance volumes. They sound, they sound great on paper, but they're not that easy to do. So most of the time in the TE environment, you're looking at the villa contracta width, and I guess in, this is where TE <coughs> would probably help a lot, right? Because yeah. you see the entire area, and maybe you want to cover that. Uh, right, so I just wanted to bring attention that that table looks really cool, but the reality is that most of the time, we screen it with transonatic, we get a sense by you by putting the pulmonary pressures and the CW density. But at the end of the day, we end up with the TE. And it can be tricky. I mean, this is kind of like TE 103. I mean, you know, you really have to have a fair amount of experience when you're looking at these prosthetic mitral valves to assess them like TE. You know, like a slam dog, you put the TE there. Oh, wow, there it is. But I, I'll show you that. But that, the, the trick I showed with playing with the color filters on the 3D for localization of PVL, that's much, much easier. 
because on the 2D slices, it's very hard to know. When, and we've seen, even in this lab, where the PVL is missed because, because the slice just wasn't obtained. Yet in a 3D view, if you're playing with the color gain, you, the color filter, rather, increase the filters, it can show you usually very nicely. The, what I did want to mention on the transthoracic, though, and we see this again referred to valve cleanup quite a lot, is somebody has a diagnosis of mitral prosthetic valve stenosis because the gradients have gone up. Stenosis, stenosis, stenosis through all the records, and then finally they get a TE, and that's the first time somebody recognizes the paravalvular leak. Yeah. <laughs> so it's the, reverged, it's the increased flow that's causing the gradient elevation, and it's not truly a stenosis. So recognize that mean gradient increase doesn't equate necessarily to stenosis, particularly on the mitral valve when it's all hidden on a transthoracic. But we've seen that a dozen times where nobody mentioned stenosis. Nobody mentioned regurg until the T. Okay. Um, that's why, I mean, the interesting thing is the trickiest of all the valve disease really is to identify prosthetic mitral regurgitation of all the valves of everything, the trickiest is prosthetic mitral valve mechanical regurgitation. Because you don't see it by color, it's hidden, and you have to kind of use your deductive thinking. Yep. It's all the, why the velocity is high, maybe the TBI is a little low, you know, I mean, uh, then the output is small compared to what the venture. I mean, you have a lot of deductive thinking mm -hmm. here for you to be able to, and not infrequently, you are the one who's going to suggest to the clinician to do a TE. So you have to be, as an interpreter, you have to be astute enough to say, hmm, there's something here fishy. Yeah. And the gradients are not that elevated. You know, we, you put it there, but usually if you tell me, even for big time prosthetic mitral regurgitation, you're at the seven, eight, you know, no, nothing dramatic, a little more, because the valve is opening well, and you know, we don't have stenosis, you have a little increase in gradient, and you start wondering of what it is. Yeah, it's often on, you know, you see these clinically, and it's PA pressure's up a little bit, the LVOT flow, outflow is down a little bit, the mean gradient's gone from four to seven, patient just doesn't feel well, and it's a T that finds it. Most of the time it's up to you as an interpreter to make that recommendation, believe it or not. Um, okay, so we'll talk a little more about Michael, uh, mitral uh, mechanicals. So I think we showed this basically at the beginning, so recognizing the different populations of flow across the mitral valve, uh, the high velocity flow through the smaller central orifice, lower velocity through the larger s side orifice. And then this is an example of PVL, and these are little washing jets. So that's okay. Um, so here's a case. So mechanical mitral valve, um, not necessarily subtle paravalvular defect here, bordering on dehiscence, it's a good size hole, um, not diagnosed before the TE. So this is a paravalvular plugging, this was a huge hole. The aortic valve always at 12 o'clock, so a very large, and this is, this is one of the most common spots for the defect, uh, tends to be, you know, I'd say this is over. Almost like three entries. Yeah, so it is almost. A, th so there was there's diastolic flow through here. Um, this actually, this patient took a VSD occluder to get this closed. Um, very large hole, and it's amazing how, you know, we've just been lucky that if you put this near the hinge points, you can get into trouble. Uh, but more often, when you put it, it, just thankfully so far we haven't really had to deal with that. So most of the time, it's far enough away from the hinge points that you don't really worry about occluding the valve. In fact, I can't think of a single case. Knock on laminate. <laughs> uh, that we've actually uh, occluded a mechanical valve uh, leaflet with a with a PVL plug. Uh, but anyway, though, even though they were close to the hinge points, do you guys yeah. avoid them? Yeah, we, we we might size a little differently. Uh, you put the you know, but it tends to, the hinge points is interesting. I don't know if it's something about the way they're sewing in or something inherent to the valve, but I can't think of a single case where the PVL was at the hinge point. Hmm. Not that it can't happen, but uh, we haven't seen that yet. Um, but this is sort of the, the trick, and it comes to what Dr. Q was talking about. So, again, this is post-procedure. This is the standard nominal color evaluation without any filter change. This is with this increase in the color filter. It's moving too fast to be useful. But when you slow that down, you see something here in early systole. You see something here in early systole, and you wait just a little further in systole, and you see all these guys. 
So the interpretation of all this is, this is para device leak. This one is borderline, I'm not sure. It's kind of right on the edge of paravalvator versus washing jet, but it's very big for a washing jet. These guys are clearly the washing jet, and this guy is one little residual paravalvator. So the, the point of that is, the car that can show you almost all of this, the key is just turn the, turn the filter way up, get rid of all the noise, and the highest velocity flow will still permeate even on a high filter, and then it's useful for localization. Okay. Um, so there's a bioprosthetic valve. This was somebody post endocarditis. Uh, and what happened was after the ravages of bacteria, they had a little PVL shown here right through the sewing and a bioprosthetic. And then they also had some diminished flow uh, because this cusp didn't open fully. So they had an accelerated flow into astole. We don't really quantitate with this, but we do quantitate the pair valve to defects with color. Uh, this is just a gross case of somebody who had a thrombosed leaflet on a mechanical valve demonstrating flow. You didn't need the color because it's pretty obvious here. Um, but in fact, as we published a while ago, you can actually uh, evaluate or estimate a valve area, flow area, using color. Okay, this is a case I've, I've shown before, but this sort of highlights why we do these things in terms of the functional evaluation. This is a real case that, of, of a, young, a young lady uh, that I met shortly after I started here. And she'd had a ball cage valve 30-some years earlier. And she seemed to be having a worsening LV systolic function uh, over a couple of years. So she had serial echoes. LV was getting a little bit bigger. Her symptoms were getting a little worse. She was 82 uh, when I first met her. And we had some serial echo evaluations. And we saw this, but this was sort of attributed to the ball cage valve as its own washing jet. Uh, <laughs> It actually didn't, didn't, it didn't look a whole lot different than the echoes going back a decade. Uh, well, that one is weird, uh, but the other one in here was concerning. I don't know what's it's washing. It's washing, it's washing, it's washing, it's washing the ventricles. It's washing the apex, yeah. So in 2008, she had an LV was enlarged, systolic function was falling. This was graded on the echo was moderate AR, functional class two. Uh, a year later, repeat echo, ventricles bigger, EF is worse. Still graded on the transthoracic echo was moderate AR. Functional class is worse. What's the gradient through the valve? Uh, unchanged, it's a ball cage valve, so I don't remember the numbers, but it was, I think it, had, it had always been, I don't know what's going on. It had always been uh, around, I'm thinking about 35. Without a Mac is unfading. I think it's this thing, because it, <laughs> we had some issues here. I don't know why that's doing that. The only time it's ever done this is when it's hooked up to a projector. It recovers fast. <laughs> I think. There we go. Steve, while you're pulling up and ask you a question. Yeah. How do you now choose between CT and TE for a valve uh, The CT is a different beast. So if it's... Uh, for paravalvator? Because it seems like TE does a great job. Well, I'll tell you, increasingly now we're using CT to guide the closure. So CT is more procedural planning as opposed to diagnostic. So the diagnosis is basically TE. So particularly for mitral, absolutely. Uh, you know, I'll tell you, we just did a case on Monday. I didn't have time to put slides on it, but it was an aortic valve, surgically implanted aortic valve uh, with uh, about a year ago with uh, two PVL sites and a patient who was failing. And so we did a T, and it had clearly had two sites. But we had done a CT, and Paul Rush did this amazing thing. He took the CT, we all sort of huddled around him. He labeled exactly where the PVL defects were on the CT, and then he co-registered that to the fluoro when the patient's on the bed. Because when you have the prosthetic image appear on the fluoro and on the CT, you can co-register based on the, on the prosthetic valve itself. So he basically drew circles. Here's a pink circle, here's a yellow circle. And, and uh, it was embarrassing because I had the T probe. And I was trying to, I was ready to guide Colin to put a catheter across the hole. He was already across before I got my image. <laughs> Honestly, he, he crossed first PVL spot in about 10 seconds. Wow. Because Pomerange had put a bullseye on it <laughs> on the screen. <laughs> uh, and then Just the second, I thought he was lucky. And then the second hole, same thing, pew, straight across. So that's the answer. CT is, is like the procedural fix. Yeah, for mitral or. I think, in my opinion, I think echo 
the beauty of TE is not necessarily to localize. The beauty of TE is identifying the reverse term jet, which you cannot identify neither by MR nor by CT. You read, you can't see it well, particularly if there, the, if the pressures are close to each other, you're not going to see a jet, right? So the, the beauty of it is identifying the issues and maybe CT to kind of nail it down and do code yeah. registration for procedure. But uh, well, this yeah, you're going to rely much more on anatomy as opposed to physiology of, of regurgitation and everything else. I'll tell you, this case, um, I don't know, we didn't do a CT, but we, I guess we could have. So this was a year later, but I had known her now for a year, and I said I was a bit alarmed when she was worse, everything on the echo was worse. She's 83, and I said, you know, what are the odds that this 83-year-old has a ball cage valve that we're having a hard time seeing and has an independent non-ischemic worsening cardiomyopathy? Um, I said, not likely. So we did a T, and, you know, the, a little underwhelming in this view. You know, there's, there's a little jet. It doesn't look severe enough to be dilating a ventricle. But when you go deep transgastric, yeah. that's the flow axis there. It's a huge PVL jet that's really orthogonal. It's totally 90 degrees um, to the you axis see of the flow. The shadowing, the blackness, yeah, yeah. The, uh, and the, yeah. the top portion, or even yeah, oh up here, yeah, yeah, all that, yeah, big cone, yeah, and that's so when you're looking shadowing. transthoracic, you're looking trying to see through that. Exactly. You know, you're looking from this side. It's very hard to see, but really, it's a deep transgastric that showed it. So I said, okay, now it's significant. It looks worse than moderate. How much? I don't know. Big decision. She's now 83. No TAVR options here. We got to send her back to surgery. Uh, you know, new to 3DT, we thought we saw a big hole here, uh, looking sort of in there from the aorta down. But we sent her to CMR, we did a 3D, because it looks nice. Um, but this is one of the first cases where CMR clearly identified the paravalvular jet. Uh, gave it a, a, a quantitation, an area. That was enough to convince the surgeon that, yeah, we, you know, uh, let's go do this. Uh, that was her ball valve, came out, this is a, uh, Small enough cutter, I believe. It's like a ball cage. Uh, it is a ball cage. Uh, and it doesn't have a complete cage. That's the one distinction about it. And it's interesting because it actually falls all the way through. This is still on my desk in my office, this valve. But there was her paravalvular defect. She's had this in for 35 years. Her aorta gave up, uh, but the prosthesis looked pristine. I mean, not a scratch on the ball. It, you know, the sutures were cut, and it was a little stained, but it looked amazing. Uh, anyway, redo AVR, and she had a full recovery. So here she is. This ventricle gets better and better every year, uh, stronger. EF goes right back up again. Um, I still follow her now. Uh, she complains she about. Changed, yeah. She <laughs> hasn't changed. No, even the bushes look the same. <laughs> she's she's uh, changed a little bit. This is very interesting because this is before the days of Tava. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And it's showing that it takes a little time for that ventricle to get better. Yeah. And we're seeing so the same thing with Tava's now that. These elderly folks, they don't jump off in EF. I mean, you need to yeah. give them a year, a year yeah. and a half. Yeah. And then you start seeing it. It's not like a, a quick recovery yeah. like we see in the younger people. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. And she did the same thing. She took a while. She yeah. took a while for the, I mean, she felt better, but she, she got better every year for about yeah. three years. Um, we have to do something with MRI and uh, be it ECB or replacement fibrosis or whatever it is. And those bad AS with really bad function. <coughs> they, these are the ones that actually would be would be fascinating to study. Yeah. And so many ways. Yeah. Um, so she's uh, Dr. V wanted to put a watchman in her. She's now 87, and I said, nope, <laughs> not yet. Um, so a little bit on PVL. Um, you know, this is what's we've talked about this before. The surgical recommendation is based on sole ring clock face doesn't really take into account the thickness of the, of the uh, PVL, which is a big issue. On surgical valves, it tends to be more thinner and crescentric, but not always. Uh, and aorta, on, on transcatheter valves, it's much more variable. If there's a, a chunk of calcium uh, right here, or actually typically usually beside the PVL, that can create a fairly thick, but not very circumferential defect. Uh, so there is this notion that, and it makes some sense, that if it's if the further along it goes, the worse the MR. The, sorry, the AI, uh, but you can have a lot through a, a defect that doesn't go very far. So, so Steve, what, what is it that circumferential extent, mm -hmm. which is what we're saying there, 
it's better than just tracing it and doing an area. You know, tracing the whole thing and saying, okay. Yeah, so the problem is, one of the problems is knowing what level you make the trace at. Oh, got it. Okay. Big difference. Yeah, because it's... It, it right, it may have, multiple right. levels may have the same extent. Yet it could do this throughout the levels. Well, that that challenge also exists with measuring the extent. Same thing. Uh, it does. It, it tends to be. You're right. It is an issue. It's uh, interesting. It's, it's interesting that nobody talks about tracing the area. Everybody talks about circumference. Well, well, there is an area. There's a discussion around that. I'll show that now. Okay. Um, I mean, this is just a case. One of our first core valves. This was the image, and this was the. You know, so it's a real challenge. This is where X-plane can be useful, is to get the right level yep. uh, if you line it up properly. So if you see it here in this narrowest portion, you can get through it if the angles work, and then you get a short axis. So that, that's one place where the area might actually be a use, useful measure. Uh, and this is another one where the, where the mid-esophageal were a little underwhelming, but the deep transgastrics were more impressive. Now, I know you don't use the color extent of the jet into the ventricle, uh, but simply it is more impressive when you see multiple jets from the deep transgastric. This patient went on to have a, a, a repeat. I think, yeah, this is, a, you see the AI fill the ventricle. This patient went on to have a, a balloon of their formerly self-expanding valve. It's forced to expand a little further. Uh, and then AI's gone. I, I quibble with this reference standard sometimes because they, they often see nothing when I see something. Uh, but we agreed in this case, so there's just a tiny, tiny trace of PVL. So this is one of the documents that's out there. Um, this is a useful figure, actually, because it does show where the PVL occurs. Uh, it tends to be within the nadars of the cusps, the native cusps, because that's where you just don't get the full circumferential uh, contact with the root. And remember, the valve is not being taken away. The native valve is still there, so that's why you have these little buckles and that's why you know it's hard to get a, a perfect seal in the nadars of each of the, uh, the commissures rather, of each of the cusps. So that tends to be where PVL occurs. This is a useful graphic because it really does show that, for example, on a transthoracic, if your defect is occurring, if this is your clock face, in the sort of 11 to 2 side, um, you know, then you go TE and it's on the shadow side of the prosthesis. Likewise, if you look from the other way around, on a T, if you look this way, you might see a 6 to 8 defect, yet from a transthoracic look in the other way, it'll be nicely shadowed by the device. So it is, you know, it's, we see that not infrequently where the AI in the case by T is called mild because they don't see it very well, yet the transthoracic the next day shows more impressive T PVL. Yeah. And initially people would say, oh, it got worse. So, no, we just got imaged differently. Uh, and this is this was a recommendation by this group, uh, looking at the five-point scheme. This is clearly a group of uh, splitters, not lumpers. But, um, but they came up with you know less than five. And again, they were talking circumference, not not pure area, but coming down to five, five to fifteen, fifteen to twenty-five. Where's the data from? <laughs> yeah, this is. Looks kind of looks good. <laughs> yeah, no data. Well, okay, initially, initially no data, but then they did retrospectively apply this to some of the core lab work from these different trials. But I mean, right now, all you could do with that data is related to events. Yeah, because that's right. Because we don't have any the other reference standard. Uh, and it's also a moving target because the events are changing, because exactly. the technologies are getting better. Uh, all of, you know, very rare now does anybody have this, because these devices, the newest devices have skirts and things. Um, so. Everybody recognizes that a lot of PVL is bad. Uh, I'll try to wrap up here. Uh, basically, prosthetic valve masses occur. There's really no way to know whether this is a vegetation or a thrombus, simply looking at its mobility in this particular case. I don't know. Uh, it could be one or the other. The clinical approach is to consider both until you figure it out. Um, this is a unique case of a bioprosthetic valve that clearly had a mass that looked kind of like a vegetation with positive blood cultures, that made it easy. Uh, for reasons that were clinical, did not get surgery. This is the same case I showed you. Uh, and then had actually a chewed up valve after several weeks of antibiotics, but actually ended up getting off antibiotics. This is sort of the natural history. This is, this is an important one to recognize, and I added a couple of slides compared to what I showed on the weekend. So this was the first TE of an elderly guy with a bioprosthetic AVR with fevers and chills. 
There was some concern about something in there. Yep. Um, more views. Yep. Showed a little wiggly. That is abnormal for a bowel prosthetic leaf of tissue. Um, relatively high surgical risk. Clinically doing well. Difficult to convince a surgeon that it was time to take this valve out simply based on the presence of one positive culture and a wiggler. Uh, you could you could discuss the wisdom of that decision, but that was the decision. But left on antibiotics. Uh, with doing well, come back for a follow-up echo at some point. How long? And nobody knows. Uh, but he came back at, at uh, oh, sorry, this was also his, his data. Uh, he did have stenosis. Uh, and this was a change from baseline, one of the velocities over four meters here. Um, variable a bit based on the R interval. So some stenosis as well. And then at two months, came back for his follow-up, feeling okay, still on antibiotics. Don't see the wiggler in this particular view. But when you look closely up here, he's developed this. All right, so that's important to look at always. Uh, when it turns sort of lucent like that, that's, that's pretty unequivocal. You can see thickening um, early after surgery. You can see it out to actually several months, um, you know, even up to three months. But after, clearly after a year or so, you shouldn't see any of that periodic thickening. This is beyond thickening. This actually has a change of density. So that suggests some liquefaction, which means abscess. But the natural history is, if you sort of follow this kind of lesion further on, we don't often get to follow a lesion. But in this case, this was the same patient until this point. Um, and that's just an X-plane sort of showing it clearly here. So that's what a peri-aortic abscess looks like. But this is sort of the next step that could happen. Right? Now, you have, now you see it pulsating, and it gets sort of cleared. So that means it's perforated. Right? That you actually get blood in there now. Once you get blood in there, it's no longer an abscess because the bacteria and the pus are gone. Um, often a whole lot of fever occurs at that point. Uh, but it's pulsatile, so now there's a connection to something, usually the ventricle. And you see that pulsatility. And then you can have a, a pseudo aneurysm. That's when it's connected on one side, it's a pseudo aneurysm. But if it busts on the other side, now it becomes a fistula. So now you've got a fistula's connection. And this is flow in. And the fistula usually is up into the ascending aorta, but it might even be to the LA. We've seen that too. Uh, that was beautiful right there. Yeah. So, so a, a technical question. Yep. We did a thing yesterday on a guy with a, kind of a similar pathology, not as big as this one. He, he looks more like he, like this patient in the previous one. <coughs> so uh, we put the region of interest right over the aortic valve and the pseudo aneurysm, really pretty, switched to 3D. It was crappy as hell. Then we say, OK, we do a 3D of the mitral valve because uh, as part of the project, and we put the mitral valve in there, include the aortic valve, and when we do the 3D, that area came out beautiful. Yeah. You know, I, my I, suspicion I is understand though. why over the aortic valve itself. I did you have both? Get. Did you have both boxes over the aortic valve? What's that? Both boxes, left and right, or just the left? What do you mean? So no, yeah, bo bo both boxes were right on. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, then I don't know. It, it just. I, my only explanation is that maybe the the um, the art reflections of the prosthesis were too strong and were perhaps overwhelming the area. I mean, the mitral valve perhaps it was less. I, I could not figure it out. But I got a, we got a beautiful picture when we did the mitral yeah. valve TE, including the or, the, the yeah. region of the aortic valve. That when we tried to do it for the aortic valve itself. I don't have an explanation <laughs> for that. I don't know. Lo and behold. Um, at this point, off to go. So I think. I'll probably just stop here. Um, you know, this is sort of the evaluation, the simple algorithm. You know, when you're concerned about prosthetic valve dysfunction, very low threshold for TE, I'm sorry, for echo in general. Uh, and then if you're concerned about specific dysfunction, TE, and then getting the files to the point, you know, when do we do more than TE uh, for procedural planning? Um, you know, usually that's it. I mean, we don't usually use CT for diagnosis. Um, not for regurgitant lesions. For uh, concerned about uh, stenosis, yes. So um, both less mitral, more aortic. When we have concerns about aortic valve stenosis, and generally you're looking at a particular thrombus in the LVOT or uh, panis in the LVOT. Or nowadays, um, you know, there's a lot of discussion around clot on the prosthetic leaflets uh, on the aortic side within the cusps of transcatheter heart valves and surgical valves. So, uh, but generally you have to see some stenosis first. So that's, I think, the use of CT in all prosthetic valves is quickly evolving. Any questions? Which? The, the slide where it's 
Not on this one. You have to come to you have to come to Valve uh, Southwest Valve Summit, which you did. So well done. Yeah, that, that one got you some money. That yeah, that was <laughs> so that one you got to drive to San Antonio. I don't share that with the local crowd. <laughs> All right, we'll stop there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.